revived and reconditioned by DKI Apex Restoration, this is Gold Ball Sports. Welcome to episode two, along with Ken Keller and our producer, graphic designer, music creator Dave Myers. I'm Scott Shastine, and hey, this is our sports talk show. We appreciate you tuning in to episode one. We had a great time. Now we're back for episode two. We are on our way, but we need your help now. You can help us out. If you like this show, we need you to go to YouTube and subscribe to our YouTube channel. And we ask you to go to Facebook. If you can't watch it live, like our page. We appreciate you sharing the show, but like the page. There's a difference there. Both help us out. Again, we need all the help we can get to spread this uh, message that we have all across the USA here. We got a great show tonight. Got a lot of things lined up for you. We're going to hand out our participation trophy. We're going to make our picks. We're going to delve into they did what. And we are going to debate. We got a good debate lined up for you later on. All that's coming up. So we got an hour show. We invite you to stay here. We get started with something that we really didn't touch on last week, and that's high school football. High school football in southern middle Tennessee is something we are going to zoom in and out of, um, just depending on the circumstances. Maybe not a weekly feature, but certainly high school sports is on our radar because on Friday nights, that's what we do. We call Tullahoma Wildcat sports. So uh, let's talk a little high school football, Ken. Let's get started with the Wildcats. We'll start here locally. Beautiful Tullahoma, Tennessee, southern middle Tennessee. Uh, by the railroad tracks. Tullahoma gets a 42-10 win over Hillwood. The Wildcats had lost four in a row. Really needed to re- a win. Desperately needed that region win, and they got it Friday night. Yeah, Scott, and they really needed the offense to get on track. You know, they'd only scored three points in their last two games. Only four touchdowns on the entire season. They made a switch at quarterback, and it paid big dividends. Coffee County. The Coffee County Red Raiders are 5-2 and two on the year, and they lead Region 3-6A. All they got to do is beat Cookville. They're going to win Region 6-3A. Yeah, uh, 3-6A. It's been a while since Coffee County won a region, but it's probably been even longer since they had a winning season. They're always in these regions. They have three, four, five teams. So... Coffee County's known to go three and seven overall, but win a region. This year, not the case. They're going to have a winning season and win the region. That's exciting for Red Raider fans. It's their 100th year of football. You know, we had our 100th year of football last year, and we made that pay off with a state championship. So let's see what Coffee County can do. Yeah, gigantic win over the favored team, the Lebanon Blue Devils, a couple weeks ago. They finished off Warren County Friday night, so they're on a roll of sorts. Absolutely. Coffee County rolling. Moore County is on track to finish second in Region 5-1A. Fayetteville is going to win that region because they're the best team, and they beat Moore County uh, pretty solidly a couple weeks ago. And in Franklin County, they still got a chance to win Region 6-5A. They've got their hands full because Page and Nolensville are both undefeated and Franklin County's got to still play both of those. So they got a chance to win the region. My guess is they finish second or third. But uh, all those area teams, Moore County, Coffee County, Franklin County, having good seasons. Yes, they are. And, uh, you know, Tullahoma breaking that four-game losing streak. We know what they've got to do the rest of the season. they got to win, 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 Scott. And uh, they got that offense on track in that 42-10 win over Hillwood Friday night. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, one of our segments – we begin with, and most weeks we'll begin with this because these are our top achievers. These are people, they didn't just do something decent over the weekend. They did something really, really well. So it's time for them to step up to the podium. Mr. Keller. Time to put on the medals, because it's medal dishing time. Gold. Let me see. Let me check. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, it's gold. Yeah, I saw a piece of your tooth fall out <laughs> on, the, on the counter. All right, Ken. Bronze medal. You got a bronze medal winner this week. I do got a bronze medal. So my first award winner tonight is the Cincinnati Bengal fans. 
Step up to the podium here at Gold Ball Sports. Your football team came out brandishing new uniforms. You look like zebras, your team did, instead of Bengals. But I've got to salute the fans because as Tua Tunga Viola was being carried off the field on a spine board with his face mask cut off, the Cincinnati Bengal fans on their home field were chanting, Tua, 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 Scott. That's a class act by the fans of the Cincinnati Bengals in the NFL. They get my bronze medal tonight on Golden Ball Sports. You know, for most of my life, the Cincinnati Bengals were referred to as the Cincinnati Bungles (laughs) because they could never do anything right. They got a good team now, and I'm with you. Their fans showed a lot of class when Tua went down with the chant, and uh, I thought it affected that whole game. Oh, yeah, and uh, we're going to talk about two or more at the, in a few minutes, but uh, who's your bronze award winner tonight, Scott? Well, I'm going to give out a bronze award to Mason Bratcher, sophomore quarterback for the Tullahoma Wildcats. Mason, come on up and get your bronze medal for episode two of Gold Ball Sports. All Mason did Friday night was start his first varsity football game, go tw- uh, 18 of 25 for 199 yards, four touchdown passes, and for good measure, he ran one in for a touchdown. So five total touchdowns, a 134 quarterback rating for Mason Bratcher. That's just off the charts, Ken. He got some help, some players coming back. Tullahoma changed some of the things they were trying to do. I thought it worked very well. Oh, yeah, it did. And he got, you know, uh, multiple targets involved early in the game. Uh, you know, we saw Malik Grizzard. We saw Ethan Hargrove catch uh, three touchdowns and score four in that game. Uh, Kai Johnson, Ezra Myers, multiple, multiple targets. When you have a new quarterback, everybody around the quarterback has to play better. The offensive line protected well. The receivers caught the passes. And the rushing game got going a little rushing bit. Jackson Sheffield good. around 100 yards. That was critical for Tullahoma to help Mason Bratcher out. But, Mason, congratulations. You get the bronze medal. Great tonight. Yeah. All right, silver medal time. Almost got to the goal. Almost to the goal, just not quite. Silver medal. Mine goes to, now this one's coming out of left field. You're going to like this. Yeah, okay. Okay. Brett Belima. All right. Do you even remember? Yes. Okay, tell me who Brett, Brett Belima is. Brett Belima is the former Arkansas Razorbacks head And coach. before that, he was hmm. Wisconsin. That's a good trivia. Wisconsin. That's it's not right. a good trivia yeah. question. Yeah, that's Wisconsin right. Badgers, that's right? right? Yes. Brett Belima went, uh, got fired by Wisconsin, went to Arkansas, left Arkansas. You know where he landed? Big Ten. Big Ten. You don't. The Illini, Illinois. That's right. Brett Belima lands at Illinois. So what's he do Saturday? He takes his then three and one, now four and one, Illini, and beats Wisconsin 34 to 10. And his defense, remember when Brett Belima was head coach at Wisconsin and you had guys gaining 2,000 yards every year? Yes. Those Wisconsin guys, they go the, and yeah, the, yeah. they go the pros. Most of them didn't do a lot in the pros, but just huge rush. I mean, they just ran it down people's throat. Well, that's what Brett Belima's Illinois team did to Wisconsin Saturday. Guess how many rushing yards Wisconsin had Saturday? Not one, but two. Oh, wow. Two rushing yards. Brett Belima's defense holds his former team to two rushing yards and beats them 34-10. He's got to be the happiest man on the planet. Well, and, and look, Paul Chris got fired after the game, so the Wisconsin coach got, got back. So, yeah, I'm sure that uh, – you know, he's pretty happy. A worthy recipient for your silver medal. Brett Belima, head coach, Illinois. You All got right. a silver medal. I do have a silver medal, and it's going to go to a New York Yankee named Aaron Judge, uh, wearing the Yankee pinstripes. All he did was hit home run number 61 last Wednesday night against the Toronto Blue Jays. He has four games left, Scott. You talk about pressure as they enter the last four games of the regular season against the Texas Rangers. You know, the pressure that's building on Aaron Judge, folks, if you got any baseball cards from 2017, go check your closets because Aaron Judge rookie cards are soaring right now. 
Congratulations to Aaron Judge for tying Roger Maris's record of 61 home runs that was established in 1961, which I did the math when I got home without a calculator and figured it's a record that has stood exactly 61 years. Scott, it's fixing to fall because Aaron Judge is going to hit one in these next four games. I was watching football, and they broke in to Aaron Judge batting, which, which is cool. They did it all weekend. That's cool. Uh, and they broke into Aaron Judge batting. And the guy said, it's 2.43. I think that was the time, 2.43 in the afternoon. This is exactly the same time <laughs> on the same day that Roger Maris hit number 61. And I thought, this is going to be awesome when Judge not, but he didn't. Yeah. But he didn't. But that's cool. Though. That would have been cool. Yeah, that, that would have been, been that, cool. Great cool. Uh, silver medalist. Aaron Judge, I hope he breaks that record. I, you know, I, I don't know what baseball records mean to people anymore. Yeah. Uh, th- that Roger Maris, sixty-one is just and Mar- stood and our whole Maris lifetime. Maris was a Yankee, so the, you know it's a win-win situation for New York Yankee fans. And for and TV. Yeah. Somebody asked if Aaron Judge played for the Chicago Chicago White Sox, would they break into football games <laughs> to show his at bat? Probably not. It pays to be a Yankee. That's a great silver medal, Ken. But you've mm-hmm. got somebody better. I've got a I've got a gold medal, and this man got absolutely lacerated last week on episode one of Gold Ball Sports. Missouri kicker Harrison Mavis, step up to the podium at Gold Ball Sports. You are my gold medal award winner tonight. What an unbelievable game for the Missouri kickers! They almost pulled off the improbable upset against the Georgia Bulldogs Saturday night at Missouri. They lose it 26 to 22. But all Harrison Mevis did after blowing the game at Auburn last week, men's missing a 26-yard field goal right in front of the Auburn oh, son. was to go five. The uh, thicker five, kicker is swagging out tonight. Yards, yard, Strut yards. it off, son. Mavis, strut like the thicker stop, kicker man. is you swagging out tonight. tonight on go, on go strut ball. it <laughs> off, son. <laughs> The uh. thicker kicker is swagging out tonight. Watch him, watch him walk. Strut it watch him walk off, off, son. <laughs> the uh. thicker kicker Jordan is. Rogers, they did a great call on that, too, man. Oh, I so can't cool. stand Jordan Rogers. Uh, yeah, oh, he did good on that call. He grates me. Harrison Mills. Jesse Palmer and Jordan Rogers both just grate me. <laughs> All right. Good gold medal winner, even though he lost the game. They play to win the game. Hey, at Go Ball Sports, we're into redemption stories. We that are. That young man redeemed himself. Because we've both been redeemed. That's right. That's right. I got a gold medal, and it's going to go to my favorite baseball team, the Atlanta Braves. You know, ever since the season started, the Braves have trailed the Mets. They trailed the Mets by ten and a half games in June. I thought typical season after a World Series win – you know, teams just kind of coast through. Injuries happen. They hadn't had Ozzy for a long time. But the Braves just kept plugging away. Matt Olson has been a perfect replacement for Freddie Freeman. They have not skipped a beat. I think he's better than Freddie Freeman. Um, he's from Atlanta. And Dansby Swanson from Atlanta. And both of those guys had home runs in three straight games. The Braves swept the Mets. Now lead the Mets by two games with three games left to go. The Atlanta Braves are going to repeat as National League Eastern Division champions. That way they're going to get a bye in the first round of the playoffs like they did last year. Don't look now, but the Braves are in position to repeat. But for now, we'll try to keep a lid on it. Braves sweep the Mets, take a two-game lead with three to go. Come get your gold medal, boys. Well done. That was a nice weekend. Step up to the podium, Atlanta Braves. Yeah, you sweep out the Mets in a crucial, critical, uh, you know, three-game series. And, uh, you know, home runs by those guys. As you said, Dansby Swanson played at Vanderbilt. Man, just a great young man. And, uh, man, he gets better and better every year. And, as you said, Mr. Olsen, a younger Freddie Freeman, he's got a lot of good years ahead of him. He's got a lot of pop in that bat, too. Right now, we're going to pause for just a second to point out that in its current state, Go Ball Sports does not have advertisers. We have some interest, 
But what we wanted to do really was get our format down, get our system down, create a product that you like, that we're happy with, that's smooth, and then begin to take on advertisers. But we want to go ahead and put this out there that if you're interested in advertising on Go Ball Sports, we're going to make it really simple. All you got to do is call me, and I'm fixing to give my cell number out to the world, 931 247 5566 931 247 5566 you give me a call and we'll talk about advertising on gold ball sports don't you think that's a good idea i Tim? think it's a fantastic idea yeah yeah so let's step back to the sec okay because look we're an sec centered program we're in southeastern united states in fact we're on the world's widest city street Look it up in the record book. The world's widest city street is Atlantic Street in Tullahoma, Tennessee. That's the street we're on. We talk SEC football. I'm gonna kind of, I'm gonna kind of flow us here, and and just bounce them off of you. Ole Miss 22, Kentucky 19. Your thoughts? Well, great game. You know, uh, Will Levis, the quarterback for the Kentucky Wildcats, had some critical turnovers uh, in the fourth quarter of that game. I believe that. Uh, Kentucky turned the ball over their last three possessions uh, in that game and a couple of them near the red zone. So, you know, look, Lane Kiffin stays undefeated with a running game. And um, so they've got Vanderbilt coming up this week, but a great win for Ole Miss at home as the West beats the East. But, Scott, we saw there's a young freshman playing for the Kentucky Wildcats that we saw play against the Tullahoma Wildcats last year named Barry on Brown. This kid is going to be all SEC freshman. He is dynamic, and I know that you saw him on Saturday. Oh, absolutely, yeah. He had a couple of long uh, pass receptions. But you see Levis there. We're, we're, going to sh we're going to show this again later in the show. Will's going to come up again later in the show. But I thought it was an interesting contrast because Ole Miss has the third fastest offense in the country. Tennessee's number one. Indiana, number two. Kentucky has the slowest offense in the country as far as how many how fast they run plays. Right. So I thought it was a great contrast yeah. between a really fast offense and a really slow pro style full huddle snap it with 2 seconds to go offense. Con Ole Miss played Kentucky's game. Kentucky dominated the style of play. But Ole Miss won the game and that really impressed me with Ole Miss adapting to Kentucky's game. And when I thought Kentucky was going to pull it out at the end. So I believe, and this question will bear itself out in the future. I believe Ole Miss is the number one challenger at Alabama in the West right now. You know, look, they, they played without their best running back, Zach Evans in that game. They were, they were out timed on possession considerably in that game, as you said, but it came down to turnovers and Kentucky just could not, you know, they drive the ball between the 30s, but just, you know, when they would get in the red zone at the end of the game, uh, you know, they, they bogged down and they had those critical turnovers by their quarterback. Good win by Ole Miss. Sure was. Undefeated. Mississippi State beat Texas A&M 42-24. Ken, Jimbo Fisher is indeed an imposter. <laughs> he is a poor, poor developer of players. He gets his talented if not more talented players, especially in the last couple of years, than anybody in the country. He's not, he's not good at developing players. I, Texas A&M looked terrible to me. Yeah, and, and, you know, you talk about styles and contrast. You know, Mississippi State with Will Rogers, they, they beat them last year. They normally sling the ball all around the field, but they, they beat, uh, beat A&M in the rush game. You know, A&M 97th now against the run in the country and they allowed six yards per carry. And that was a recipe for disaster along with their turnovers. Uh, Max Johnson banged his hand up, the quarterback for Texas A&M. Uh, they switched off quarterbacks. And look, I've got to credit, I've picked Ole Miss to beat Kentucky. They were underdogs, but I did pick A&M to beat Mississippi State. I did not see this one coming. I thought A&M was a better team than this. And they get blown out 42 to 24 in Starkville. The, cowboy, the Cowbells make the noise. That uh, Mississippi State team's making some noise right now. Yeah, they are. That's why I'm wearing the shirt. That's right. Yeah. 
State, Starkville. All right, LSU beat Auburn 21-17. I thought Auburn just gave up the second half. They just quit, quit uh, trying to play offense in the second half. Auburn is the most boring, blah, team for me to watch. Even though they were up 17 to nothing, I never thought that Auburn was going to win the game. Yeah, and, and, you know, they get up 17 to zip, and that's a, you know, that's a big-time lead. But, you know, you can't minimize sports injuries. The opening kickoff of that game, you know, uh, the LSU Tigers get their punt return, their kickoff returner knocked out and carried off the field. You look at appeared a serious injury. He's got a bruised spinal cord, so I think he's going to be okay. But you could see that really affect his teammates with the LSU Tigers. They fall behind 17 to zip. But you got to give Brian Kelly and the, and the LSU Fighting Tigers, you know, credit for their resiliency and their bounce back, uh, you know, at Auburn. That's a tough place. Anywhere in the SEC is tough to win, but especially when you're down and you fall in a 17 to zip uh, a deficit. So, uh, got to credit Jaden Daniels, the quarterback for LSU, and that defense that shut the Auburn Tigers down for the rest of the game, and they had they created a turnover had on a gimmick play late six. in the game. Yeah. Had to pick six. We had just pick, saw pick the six. pick six. Yep. Two-yard touchdown run there, and LSU comes from behind to beat Auburn 21-17. to A game I watched pretty much the whole game uh, was Georgia 26, Missouri 22. The Tigers led the whole game. After a long splash play, right at the end, everybody runs down the field, and the Tigers try to hurry up at the yes. one-yard line. Now, Ken, we've seen it in high school. <laughs> we've seen it in college. Mm. We've seen it in mm. pros. We've seen, all, we've seen it in all three of them this year. Football God's rule. Splash play, over 50 yards. You're at the one-yard line. Do not try to hurry up. You get that five-yard penalty. You go back to the six. You kick a field goal like Missouri, you lose to Georgia. Missouri kept getting in the red zone, kept kicking field goals. You know what I say while I'm sitting watching TV? I'm saying, you can't beat Georgia kicking field goals, boy. Right. You can't beat Georgia kicking field goals. And when they got that illegal procedure penalty at the one-yard line, had to go back to the six, mm -hmm. Kicked the field goal. There was no doubt Georgia was going to go right down the field and score and win that game. There was no doubt. No, you right. could just see it. Yeah. And, and you know, they they had – the Georgia Bulldogs did not score a touchdown until 9.22 left in the fourth mm -hmm. quarter. The defense was stifling for Missouri. They were playing lights out. The offense was scoring points, not albeit not coming out with touchdowns, but building that lead 22-12. to 12. Uh, there, you know, at the end before Georgia, and you knew that's going to, I texted him, I said, I said, uh, drink wits will choke, uh, the, the uh, Missouri Tigers will choke, Georgia's going to come back and win this game. That's exactly what happened. Uh, you know, they did a good job of containing Brock Bowers, and I saw some concern from the Georgia Bulldogs. Not a whole lot of explosiveness at wide receiver. Stetson Bennett couldn't get the ball downfield to the wide receivers. They harassed him all night. They've got good tight ends, does the Georgia Bulldogs. They got a good running back in Kendall Milton. They got two or three good running backs. I don't know if they got the downfield explosiveness. They dropped in the pole. I told you that's what was going to happen. They dropped in the polls to number two after that narrow victory, 26-22, over. And they were lucky to escape the Missouri Tigers, and that was a critical play. You pointed out perfectly, Scott, you can't trade threes for sevens. You got to have them sevens. When you're playing a Georgia – that's right. And you have it first and goal at the one-yard line, you can't get that five-yard yeah. penalty because you're probably not scoring. Yeah. And to your point, when you rush inside the five-yard line and you know, you're wondering as a fan, you're saying, slow down. What is the hurry? Why the panic? It's, it, to me, it's harder for the offensive players to get up because if they flinch, they move in motion. The penalties on them. The defensive guys can run around in chaos all over the place. Exactly. You're not getting them messed exactly. up. You're messing your own team up. And so that's, that's what, a great observation. And that's what teams don't do is they don't get set. That's right. At that at that one yard line. So 
no hurry up at the one yard line. Take your time. Get down there and make sure you got the right play. You got four chances. Hey, listen to Gold Ball Sports Strategy, head coaches. You're gonna, <laughs> you may learn something. That's, right. That's what we want to be known for is advising <laughs> coaches. Bama. We're all, we're all, just kidding. We're armchair quarterbacks, guys. Take it easy on us. Bama drills Arkansas 49-26. Tell me about a young man named Jamil Gibbs. Yeah, Jameer Gibbs. I said it last week in episode one right here on Gold Ball Sports. I said the key matchup of this game – would be Alabama running back Jameer Gibbs against Arkansas linebacker Bumper Pool. Well, all Jamar Gibbs do was make Bumper Pool look like Bumper Fool as he raced down the field with a speed of 22.8 miles per hour. They measured it through the metrics, which is faster than any player has run in the NFL this year, and this was by college player Alabama running back Jameer Gibbs. Alabama players are not college players. They <laughs> they play for college, but yeah. they're not college players. And, and, you know, in that game, Bryce Young goes out. You know, Alabama had complete control of that game, up 28 to nothing. Alabama fans, if you were in a cave this weekend and you're going to watch the replay tonight, do not turn the third quarter on. Arkansas stormed all the way back. I love what their head coach did, Sam Pittman, at halftime. They're down 28 to 7. They score at the end of the first half to get a little bit of momentum. He doesn't take them in the locker room just for just a very short break. He brings them back out into the end zone. During halftime, they're doing push-ups, jumping jacks. They're running plays. They're practicing in the end zone. They cut it to 28-23 before Jalen Milrow, the Alabama quarterback, who is the fastest player on Alabama's team, yes, faster than Jameer Gibbs, ran a 77-yard touchdown and really broke the back of the Razorbacks. 35-23 at that point, Alabama wins, going away uh, 49-26. And we'll Big talk, win for Alabama we'll, on the road. We'll talk about where the tide goes from here when we get to our picks for this week. All right, segment time. And this is where we point out just stuff over the weekend that's just weird. That's called They Did What? Did what? Tua, Tua. Poor Tua. He's out with a concussion. Miami Dolphins quarterback went out Thursday night uh, in the Dolphins' loss to the Cincinnati Bengals. Um, but, Kim, we talked about this some um, this weekend um, at the fact that Tua was even in the game. He, it, it amazes me in 2022 that the NFL's concussion protocol allowed Tua to get hurt mm -hmm. on a Sunday. And I think we've got the video of, of Tua when he got hurt on the Sunday. There it, you see that there. He, he gets taken down and, and just not really slammed to the ground, but as you, as you see when he gets up, he's, bob, he's stumbling, he, he falls down. I mean – Obviously concussed. Obviously concussed. There's nothing else that makes you act like that. Can they leave him in the game? Yeah, you know, and, and, and you know, I, I was watching that. I saw the replay on the red zone. You know, watching it, watching the NFL red zone, which is fantastic to watch on Sundays. You see every score and play inside the red zone, and you know, it was just an innocent push to the to the numbers. A hard push after he released the pass. They did call a uh, personal foul, unnecessary roughness, which I did not think was warranted there because I. I'm going to – I'll give you a different spin on the second hit here in a minute. But, you know, it was obvious. It didn't take a – well, a neurologist, maybe a flunky neurologist, that the Miami Dolphins, since this guy's been fired, a, a, a guy they bring in as one that's not affiliated with the team just to be an observer and, and, you know, run the protocol test or whatever they run. Look, my son got a concussion in the ninth grade chasing an interception down the sidelines. He was blindside hit. I was there, and I could hear it sound like a train, train wreck. A helmet to helmet. It knocked him six yards in the air. Heath McCullough, the trainer for Tellum at the time, came over to me and my wife at the fence. We were concerned. He was out on the ground for a couple minutes. He got up, wobbling back all the way. Had to run across, walk across the sidelines with help. He said, "He said, Mr. And Mrs. Keller, you know, we asked him to count backwards from ten. He flunked it miserably. We asked him who his girlfriend was. He didn't have a clue. We asked him what his birthday or what month he was even born in. He could not answer any of those questions whatsoever. 
And, uh, and, and, you know, of course, they shined a light in the eyes, not good response, you know, foggy. And we took him right after the game to, you know, to Hardin Hospital to be examined. And they told us there, they said, look, don't be playing video games for a lot, for six weeks, and don't be in an airplane. And what happens Thursday night? So we fast forward to Thursday night. Well, Sunday night, we know what happens. We know. Tua we, gets on an airplane. Yeah, yeah. Now, that was, yeah, that was Sunday. Right? Yeah, yes, yes. And then... Thursday night, yes, they clear him to play, which that's what I don't understand is how he ever got cleared to play on Thursday. But then on Thursday, this happens. Tua, back to throw. Yeah, now this was a DDT body slam. This looked like Turkey Jones slamming uh, Terry Bradshaw. There was not even a flag, personal foul call. Look on at this the play, fingers, which was absolutely egregious. Look at the and fingers. So if you look at the fingers, so what that was that he was going through was called decorticate posturing. That is where the legs turn in, the toes turn in, the arms fall back to the chest, and then you see this decorticate posturing, which is a sign of a brain trauma injury. It was horrific to watch it. My son called me. I just got back home from a from a, a, a fall baseball game and turned it on right when it happened and it was sickening to watch. And you, you know, you look were just at the fingers. at that point. Yeah, yeah. we're showing You look it. at his fingers contorting and then they bring the spine board out. They cut the face mask off. They don't move to his head, which, you know, they did a good job of that. You saw the Dolphin players come out and pray for Tua. And then you saw as he's carted off the Cincinnati Bengal fans with an act of class and grace chanting Tua, Tua, Tua. Scott, I don't know what the future holds for Tua. He's been through some devastating injuries before. A hip injury where 600 pounds of two Mississippi State defensive ends crushed his hip. Bo Jackson injury, they said he'd be, he would be would never walk again. The blood flow would be cut off in his hip. But that young man is resilient. Don't count out. To a tongue of Ola, but count out those Miami Dolphin doctors. They ought to be held responsible for this for this situation. Unfortunately, count out the Miami Dolphins because Teddy Bridgewater ain't going to get oh, it. Oh man! <laughs> no, he was he was bad in there. And they were off to a good season. Yeah. I was kind of I, I like Miami. I like yeah. their uniforms. I, you know, but uh, yeah. man. That, yeah, they're a different team with two, so we'll see. So that's the that, that, that's they did what? Yeah, they did. They what? did what? They, they did put what? him back in the game. The yeah. NFL allowed him to play three days later. Yeah, now, and then that happens. Yeah. And I, and I got to go back go go back to the Sunday game though against the Ravens. It's because the medical examiner would probably say after the game, "Well, see, I told y'all he was okay. He went out with the concussion, walking wobbly leg, and went thirty six for fifty. 468 yards and six touchdowns against Lamar Jackson and the Baltimore Ravens and brought him back from a 21-point deficit, the largest deficit the Dolphins have overcome in many, many years in the last 12 minutes of the game. Now, how do you do that with a concussion? That's a double they did what? <laughs> I would almost bet you that in the future sometime, if this guy has a good enough career, it could be over. But if he has a good enough career... They'll do a, a documentary on him, right? Yeah. And they'll talk, whoops, they'll talk to him about the game, this episode. No doubt. And I 100% predict that Tua will say, I don't hardly remember anything about throwing those six touchdowns. I don't remember I agree with hardly you anything about yep. that game. You've seen it over and over on, on interviews with yeah. players. Yeah. And, you know, my, my favorite player growing up, Roger Stallback with the Dallas Cowboys, I went back and watched videos. He estimates he had anywhere, he had around 10 concussions. And, uh, you know, I just see over and over the smelling salts on the sidelines. And, uh, you know, a lot of times those guys would go back in the game with concussions. A lot's changed, but maybe a lot's not changed. The NFL needs to take strict measures, re-examine their concussion protocols, and take action fast. We pause right now to point out that Go Ball Sports, in its present state, has no advertisers. We hope to change that. We want to get our format down. We want to get our systems down. We want our product to be as good as it can be. And then we're going to lock in on some advertisers. But we'd like to talk to you about it, kind of introduce you to what we're doing, talk to you about what we're trying to do. If you're interested in being a sponsor for this program, give me a call at 
Not right now. We're on the air. But in the future, we'll be glad to talk about advertising because your spot could be right here. We could play the commercial. We can do a live voice commercial, however you want to do it. That's how we're going to do it. But we're going to work some advertisers into this format, and we'd like for you to be one of them. All right, our next segment is the old participation trophy. Ken, you got that trophy? I Bring her out do. here. Participation well, trophy. Let me take my Tua jersey and shine this thing up real good. Tribute to Tua after his injuries. We hope he gets better here at Gold Ball Sports. Participation. <laughs> All right, partner, who you got? Well, this is Gold Ball Sports, and this is where participation trophies simply don't cut it. Ohio State Buckeyes, come get a piece of this participation trophy on episode, episode two of Gold Ball Sports. You ran a fake punt up 49 to 10 with nine minutes and 24 seconds left in the game. Shame on you. That's running the score up on your opponent. Uh, the poor Rutgers Scarlet Knights. This caused a brawl on the game where Rutgers head coach Greg Schiano, who was an assistant with Ryan Day at Ohio State under head coach Urban Meyer in 2017 and 18, storms across the field with his players. There's some shoving going on. Schiano goes after Ryan Day. The Ohio State Buckeyes were at fault. You don't run a fake punt up 49 to 10, Scott, no more than you run a suicide squeeze in baseball in the eighth inning up by 10 runs. Ohio State Buckeyes and your special teams unit, you get the participation trophy from me this week. Well, you know my stance. Not that we debate participation trophies, but I always believe that you coach your team to be play as well as possible. If they score 100 points, they score 100 points. You need to work on that fake punt sometime. You're not ever in any close games where it really matters. The only chance to do that is at the end of the year. So you got to work on it sometime. It's like uh, Pearl Cone working on their two-point conversion or, or whatever. Marshall County working on their two-point conversion against I'm consistent. I you, are you are consistent. You are consistent. My participation trophy – we're splitting it because, uh, you know, Will Levis, that, that, was just, that was just too good. A single play. You had it all. Down four. He just went back, Ken, and just lost the ball yeah. as he went back to throw it. Mm. Went goes. Oh. The ball goes backwards. Will Levis, you may have to share this with the Buckeyes. But you get a participation trophy tonight because that's weak. Kentucky, how are you ever going to get over the top if you can't win those type of games? Ole Miss is winning them. Mississippi yeah, State's are. winning them. That's right. All right, Ken, new segment tonight. New segment tonight. You're going you're gonna to introduce this and, and tell us what we're doing. Here. Yeah, we, we appreciate all you, all you Facebook Live fans out there. And uh, Mr. Bill has decided he was going to uh, – Call into the show tonight here on episode two. He said he loved the show so much. Uh, we resurrected him from the 1980s. And uh, so he's going to join us tonight. He's a big football fan. And uh, he's got a, we got a question we asked him. And you're fixing to hear what it is. Oh, thank you. It's Mr. Bill here. Special thanks to Mr. Scott, Mr. Ken, and Mr. Dave for letting me be here with you today. Oh. <laughs> Mr. Ken asked me to talk to you about if Alabama can beat Texas A&M and Tennessee without Bryce Young. Mr. Bill? Mr. Ken asked me to talk to you about if Alabama can beat Texas A&M and Tennessee without Bryce Young. Mr. Bill and Mr. Han say Texas A&M, yes. Their offense is stuck in the 1980s, which was a really popular time for me, and I think maybe the last time Tennessee beat Alabama. Too much head trauma during those years. Oh, no! 
even though they call him a quarterback expert, Coach Jimbo Fisher has some really bad quarterbacks. They are so painful to watch. It reminds me of the time I went to the dentist. Oh, no. But Alabama will be really mean to whoever plays quarterback for them. But Tennessee, oh, no. Tennessee scores too many points with their offense. The good news is that Sluggo tells me that Bryce Young should be back in time for the UT game. Mr. Beals says Alabama by two touchdowns if Bryce returns, but the game is a pick 'em with Jalen Milroe behind center. Well, that's all for this week. Uh oh, Sluggo is going to be really mean to me because I didn't let him talk today. Oh no! <laughs> Oh man, that I Mr. You, Bill calls yeah. in. Yeah, so Mr. Bill, Mr. Bill knows football. Mr. Bill. Mr. Bill's funny, and he's got football IQ. I'm I'm impressed with Mr. Bill. Mr. Bill, you have to call back in next week. All right, you be the judge. Facebook, you be the judge. What we're looking for is comments during the live show. We we'll read the comments. We don't have to read your name or anything like that. We just. Would appreciate your feedback, and certainly when you go back and watch the replay on YouTube, subscribe to our YouTube channel. We need subscribers. That's what helps build the audience and attract advertisers. And then we need you to share tonight's program on Facebook. Just share it with your Facebook friends. And give the Facebook page a like. It's Go Ball Sports. Give that page a like. You can really help us out by doing those things. All right, Ken. It's time to get down and dirty. We've been Jimbo and Saban. They've been going at it since summer. It's time for to debate it. All right, so back in the summer, or I don't know, SEC media days, whenever it was, Jimbo Fisher, the head coach at Texas A&M, and Nick Saban, the head coach at Alabama, had a little spat talking about NIL, image, name, image, likeness, college athletes getting paid. I think we've got some of the audio from that conversation. We were second in recruiting last year. A&M was first. A&M bought every player on their team, made a deal for name, image, and likeness. All right, we didn't buy one player. All right, but I don't know if we're going to be able to sustain that in the future because more and more people are doing it. It's despicable that a reputable head coach could come out and say this when he doesn't get his way or things don't go his way. The narcissist in him doesn't allow those things to happen. And it's ridiculous. But when, when he's not on, some people think they're God. Go dig into how God did his, his deal. You may find out about, about a guy that a lot of things you don't want to know. We built him up to be the czar of football. Go dig into his past or anybody that's ever coached with him. You can find out anything you want to find out, what he does and how he does it. And it's despicable. Uh, what evidence did you have that uh, Texas A&M bought its entire recruiting class? You know, I, I, I didn't really say that anybody did anything wrong. Well, you said they bought their recruiting class. I didn't say anybody did anything wrong, okay? And I've said everything I'm going to say about this, but... You know, I, I think that, um, you know, I guess the point, and I should have ne never mentioned any individual institutions, I said that before. Is Jimbo lying when, you say, when he says that, uh, that they didn't do anything? I have no problem either. with Jimbo. Uh, I have no problem with Jimbo at all. Oh, Ken. Let's debate. The reason State your case. My jury. case is this. NIL is legal. NIL is the way to go. Texas A&M may have bought their whole team. I hope Tennessee is buying their whole team. It's legal. That's where college athletics is going. There's no way to turn back from it. Nick knows it, and he knows what he's doing. The fact that he claims that not one of his players has an NIL deal when Bryce Young, if I'm not mistaken, had a million-dollar deal before he had ever played a down for Alabama. Um, I'm going with Jimbo here. I'm going with Jimbo. 
Saban had no business saying a word. Okay. I'm going to agree with what Jared said last week as when he chimed in on Facebook Live and said that Jimbo is an imposter. Jimbo Fisher is an imposter, and he's also a cheater, and he's also a liar. He's 1-4 against Alabama, and I agree with what Steve Spurrier said. Steve Spurrier said, I don't understand why Jimbo Fisher is mad at Saban. Did, did Saban say something that wasn't true? No, it's absolutely true. NIL is name, image, and likeness. And the, the Texas A&M Aggies has taken what was meant for players to make extra money through signing autographs or making a commercial and selling their brand into a recruiting buying mechanism to buy the best team that he could get with Texas oil money. And he spent $38 million of that Texas oil money with them big cowboy hats in Texas. And he bought the number one recruiting class in the nation in the history of the nation. They lost five ball games last year and come up with the number one class. How in the world does that happen unless you put $38 million out there? And one of the recruits they bought was the beloved Tennessee Vol. They had him all wrapped up. Number one defensive tackle in the nation, Walter Nolan out of Knoxville Powell High School, who was all but set to uh, take residency into the University of Tennessee and become a dominant defensive player for the Tennessee Vols, along with Amari Thomas, the big O. And all of a sudden, he steers down to uh, College Station. Okay? So, you look at that, and then you look at the character and integrity of who's making, who's denying these claims and said it's despicable. You know what is despicable? What is despicable, Jimbo Fisher, is you allow, you coaching at Florida State and allowing Jameis Winston to go steal crab legs out of a Publix, and then he had sexual assault, rape allegations against him uh, from his accuser, and he didn't miss one single game, and you win the national championship in 2013. Don't school people on integrity and character, okay? You said when you was a little kid that when you lied and cheated that your daddy used to slap you in the head and that maybe somebody needs to slap Nick Saban in the head. Well, I got news for you. Alabama's waiting on you down in Tuscaloosa Saturday night. I'm going to be there to watch it, and I'm going to tell you what's going to happen. Nick Saban's going to slap you like Will Smith did, uh, did Chris Rock at the Oscars. Just like that. That's what's fixing to happen to you, Jimbo Just Fisher. Just going to walk right up to him and smack him. That's what's fixing to happen Saturday night. Mark it down. I just ain't buying it. <laughs> NIL is completely legal once again. It doesn't matter, matter whether Texas A&M spent $38 million or $538 million. If they've got it, spend it. It's a legal deal. That's what it was opened up from. Look, nobody... Anybody who thought when NIL opened up that all this was going to be was some guy signing some jerseys and getting, you know, $50 from some promoter. Some, no, no. College athletics makes billions and billions of dollars. It was bound, to, as soon as the floodgates opened, it was bound to happen. Yes, I agree with Saban on one point, and that is... What's the future going to look like here in, in 10 or 20 years of this? Are we going to have, you know, 10 programs, three programs, one program that's just dominating every year, everything, because they've got the most money? Well, I don't know. But I know we have had one program dominating everything for the past 10 years in the system that we had, and that was Alabama. So I don't blame Nick Saban for being a little pissed off when the system changes and it gives everybody else a chance to get those top recruits. So that's what he's mad about. You're I'm with Jimbo here. Right. Even though he does not know how to develop players, he knows how to get them, and that's cash money, baby. Your Honor, I asked, time, I asked for a rebuttal. <laughs> So, 30 seconds. 30 second rebuttal. NIL was not meant to have open collectives at the university collect all the money and start buy, buy your recruits. Okay, that was not the intent of it. Jimbo Fisher has sub subverted the intent of it. But hey, Nick Saban, you changed the rules on him. You, you changed the recruiting rules on Nick Saban. Uh, you've changed all, the RPO rules. That's all right. Alabama's got money down there in that state too, and they love the football program. Beware. Just be careful what you ask for, Jimbo, and the rest of college football. No Just question saying. about it. No question about it. Alabama's got the money. Just saying. They're going to have to play ball. All right. To me, the most exciting part of the program. So we head toward the finish line here. 
It's time to make our picks. Now look, this is for entertainment purposes only. We don't advise you to uh, risk your hard-earned money based on what we say. Because we know nothing. We're just your gold ball sports hosts. Ken, I couldn't be more excited. University of Tennessee has got an opportunity um, bigger than the Florida opportunity, I believe, this week. Mm -hmm. Because anytime you go to Baton Rouge and take on LSU, you got your hands full. Now, the balls have gotten a break because the game's at 11 o'clock in the morning. Most of the time you play LSU, it's that late 8 o'clock game, and they're just crazy down there. But 11 o'clock in the morning, to me, <clears throat> it doesn't give Tennessee an advantage, but it is an advantage for Tennessee when you look at the pros and cons of this matchup. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Great matchup, 11 a.m. game, uh, Central Time. And uh, I know that, hey, it's a big game because Josh Pate at, at, at Lake Kick Sports is going to be there. And he's not even going to one game. He's making both of them. He's going to Tennessee, LSU, and then coming to Tuscaloosa to watch Alabama and A&M play. Scott, you know it's big when Tennessee breaks out the smoky gray uniforms. I got a text right on the way over here that Tennessee was breaking out the smoky grays. Watch out. On the road? On the road. Again, LSU always wears their whites. They're like the Dallas Cowboys. They wear their white jerseys at home. And I listened to Brian Kelly's press conference uh, this afternoon, and uh, he pleaded, he pleaded with Tiger Nation to show up early and be loud because they like it at nighttime down there. And this is going to be a great matchup. Jaden Daniels against Hendon Hooker. Uh, you know, LSU can cause Tennessee. The matchup I'm looking at is the wide receivers for the LSU Tigers. Uh, Brian Thomas and Kayshawn Booty against the Tennessee cornerbacks. I think that's an area that LSU can possibly expose if they've not went downfield in the ver downfield in the vertical game in the vertical passing game that Brian Kelly wants to do. They've also got a home run hitter, John Emery, at running back and some good depth. Tennessee, though, I think's got too many weapons. They had an off week, which is critical. Uh, Josh Heupel spent spent the off week recruiting and game planning for the next couple of weeks. Tennessee's favored by three and a half, Scott. I like the Vols to cover the spread at Baton Rouge. They're just a better football team all around than LSU is. The last time Tennessee was at Baton Rouge, Derek Dooley had mishandled some bad clock management and blew the game for Tennessee, a game that they had won, and again snatched, snatched uh, defeat from the jaws of victory. But I like the balls to win this game. And Coach Dooley was good at that. He could snatch a defeat right out of those jaws <laughs> yeah. of victory. With his he? Buster Brown shoes yes. on the sideline. And his orange pants. Yeah. Or his orange. crutches. Yeah. <laughs> or his little stool that he set. Derek Stooley. Is Derek what they Stooley. Call him one time yeah. on the stool. So Tennessee giving three and a half on the road at LSU. Yeah. Boy, who's, you know, who's all that coming at the beginning of the year? I didn't. Um, yeah, and we've already had some good 11 o'clock a.m. matchups at Alabama-Texas game. I'm looking forward to waking up early, having my coffee, watching uh, game day SEC Network, and uh, checking out that first game at 11 o'clock. It's going to be a good one. I usually wake up and watch the week's episode of Gold Ball Sports. But, hey, you do your thing. Uh, yeah, okay, you be right. you. That's it. You uh, be you. You do you. You know how much I hesitate to take Tennessee – especially when we're giving points, especially when it's three and a half. That's a tough line, but I got to go with you. I mean, based on what I've seen from LSU's offense, of course they've got, what, um, you know, really good personnel. It's LSU. They're like Texas A&M. They got a lot of money at LSU. They've always got really good personnel. But they don't seem to they – have, they haven't jailed behind Brian Kelly yet. I don't know if they ever will. Uh, Tennessee is gelling behind Josh Heupel. And, um, you know, unless Tennessee has an off day, um, I feel confident in Tennessee's backup quarterback if it comes to that. I don't like Tennessee's running game. I don't think it has been an effective tool. They need to run the ball better Saturday morning you, you, uh, because that atmosphere, that up-tempo gets tough. Uh, Tennessee needs to run the ball a little bit better on Saturday, but I like the balls to cover 
I think Tennessee it's wins good. it by ten or more. Well, Scott, they've got to block BJ Ojolari. This this guy's a defensive end is an animal. It gets, it's it's good timing for Tennessee because they're going to still see somebody like him the next week in Will Anderson. So this gives them practice for blocking those kind of guys the next two games. I hope the LSU game is just practice for the Alabama game. Uh, Texas A and M travels to Alabama. Bama giving twenty four and a half points to A and M. You know, I always say bet Bama, especially on Saturday. Why? Because Nick, payback. It's payback time. And that's where you do it is on the field. Uh, Alabama, it's not that it doesn't matter who their quarterback is, but Milrow is really good. Look at all the Alabama quarterbacks in the NFL. I mean, if you step in behind center at Alabama, you're a really good quarterback. So is there a drop-off from Bryce Young? Sure. Can Alabama – Cover that up with everything else? Absolutely. I think they just destroy A&M. You know, Alabama showed signs of pass in the, in the vertical passing game last week. Kobe Prentice, JoJo Earl was back. Uh, some of those young receivers stepped up, flashing speed. Tyler Harrell, not back yet. He's the transfer in uh, from Louisville that runs a 4-2, and they compared to Tyreek Hill. He'll be back soon. But, yeah, there is a drop-off. Uh, you know, 24-and-a-half points, that's a lot of points. I think Alabama's going to win this game, but Texas A&M is going to come in and fight. Jimbo's not going to roll over. You've seen the feud. He's not going to come in to get embarrassed. They are a physical team, is A&M. They can match Alabama on the lines of scrimmage, but I think Alabama's going to win it. Even with Jalen Miller, quarterback, they're going to win that game, and they're going to, they're going to give the A&M Aggies their third loss of the season. Yeah, and I think Jimbo's losing that team. And it I'm going it, to be there. So it won't be wait. the last loss for A&M. You are going to be there. Missouri at Florida, as we speed it up a little well, bit. Well, these are two teams. You don't know which team's going to show up. You know, the, the Missouri that blew the game and looked horrible at the end against Auburn or the one that nearly upset, then number one, the Georgia Bulldogs. Same thing, conversely, with Florida. AR-15 looked like garbage the first four games of the season. Three or four games of the season, he comes out against Tennessee and looks like a Heisman candidate. So, I'm just going to give Florida the edge just because they're at home and uh, two emotional losses in a row for Missouri. I just think it's too much to overcome. Missouri, <coughs> if they have a chance to win it, they're not going to Yeah, they're not going to win it. So I'm, I'm with Florida all the way. Arkansas, Mississippi State, my Bulldogs at home again in Starkville. I'm taking Mississippi State to beat Arkansas. This is also going to be another tough game for Arkansas, man. They played A&M. Alabama, and now they've got this game on the Mississippi State. What a brutal stretch. The toughest schedule in the country, the Arkansas Razorbacks. I like what Mississippi State's doing. i got to go with the Pirate, and i got to take Mississippi State to beat Arkansas as K.J. Jefferson was, was taken out at the end of the game hurt uh, versus Alabama. Don't know how bad that is or if he'll be back if it's questionable, but I give, uh, I give the advantage to Mississippi State and Will Rogers uh, against uh, Arkansas. Set, setting SEC records every weekend, yeah. Will Rogers the third. Auburn travels to Georgia, the mm. South's longest-running rivalry. Um, again, I don't see a contest here. Yeah. Auburn has shown me nothing. Georgia, they just sleepwalking. They're just trying to get through the season undefeated. I don't think this is where they slip up. Beware, Auburn Tigers. Two mediocre games in a row for Georgia. They dropped to number two. They're going to be angry, and they're going to play angry. This is going to be a wipeout early. Ole Miss. Travels to Nashville to take on Vanderbilt. I know you're trying to be fair and put Vanderbilt in the picks, but uh, Ole Miss by 30. Yeah, Got to go with the fighting Kippins. Ole Miss stays undefeated. Yeah. What they showed me last week, they can play that Kentucky football. Mm -hmm. That opens up a whole new avenues for Ole Miss to That's me. Right. South Carolina travels to Kentucky. Kentucky trying to rebound, fall out of the top ten. Um this is what Kentucky kind of does under Mark Stoops. They start really fast, and then they stumble. I think they're going to bounce back. I'm not sold on Beamer ball. No. I, I'm not been impressed with what Shane Beamer's been doing. Not impressed with the transfer quarterback that, that came in from Oklahoma, Spencer Radler, uh, to the South Carolina Gamecocks. I've got Kentucky there, a much, much better team than South Carolina. Is. Much better I team. I enjoy watching Kentucky. They are old school. And then what will be an SEC game in a couple of years Oklahoma and Texas play in the Red River rivalry, uh, which is always a fun game to watch. Um, man, Oklahoma, I love what's happening with them. Yeah. I love the fact that I get to say tonight that I'm taking the Texas Longhorns over the Oklahoma Sooners. Um, letting Coach Riley go was not their best move. Uh, I think Oklahoma 
it may be coming back to the pack a little bit. Yeah, they get bludgeon by the TCU Horn Frogs, and uh, it, it was bad. It was not even as close as as, as bad as the score was. It could have been worse. TCU just ran yeah. up and yeah, down. Yeah, Sunny Dykes and TCU, watch out for them. But you know, this is a game that SEC fans will watch with interest because these two teams, as you said, come to the SEC soon. NFL picks real quick tonight. We got Monday Night Football. Rams at the 49ers. The 49ers don't know who their quarterback is. Jimmy G is not the answer. Uh, the other guys hurt. The Rams know exactly who their quarterback is, defending Super Bowl champions. Um, this would be a typical pro football game if the 49ers cover or win because you know all the money's on the Rams, but I'm taking the Rams. Yeah, um, you know, Trey Lance knocked out for the year. And so I'm going to go with Jimmy G, and this is a repeat of the NFC, NFC Championship game last year that the Rams won. I think the 49ers get revenge, Scott. And I got, we got to close this show. And so far. Yes. All right, one more pick. Titans at the Commanders. Tennessee at Washington. Titans at Commanders. Hey, the Titans eked one out. A big win, though, in division against on the road against the Indianapolis Colts. The Held Commanders on for dear are life. absolutely terrible. They're pitiful. <sighs> I've got some bones to pick with the Commanders right here after this pick, but I got the eek. Tennessee Titans to win again. Eek one out is a strong phrase. Yes. Eek is a strong phrase. Yes, indeed. I'll take the Titans. They seem to be yeah. getting it rolling. As long as Derrick Henry yeah. rushes 400 yards, mm -hmm. Tennessee Titans win yeah. for the most part. When he doesn't, they don't. Yeah. So, so, so let me tell you what I did yesterday, Scott. I right. turned on the football game to watch my most beloved rivalry of all time. My most beloved rivalry of the all time is the Dallas Cowboys against the Washington Redskins. Now, I brought my Dallas Cowboys hat in from 1974 as a nine-year-old kid. I got memories from the Cowboys, the greatest rivalry in, in pro football Marine. was Cowboys and the Redskins, not the Cowboys and Commanders. So what happens? I turn the TV on, and this team, the Cowboys are playing at home, Cowboys in their white jerseys. They're playing a team with black and gold jerseys. I said, where's the garnet and gold? What in the world? I said, the Cowboys are playing the Pittsburgh Steelers? No, they was playing the Washington Commanders. I miss seeing that Redskins logo on the side of the helmet. I miss them garnet and gold uniforms. I miss Walt Garrison against Billy Kilmer. I miss Roger Staubach against Larry Brown and Dyron Talbert. I miss all those matchups. And I miss Crazy Ray. Let me tell you who Crazy Ray is. Crazy Ray Jones. I collect sports cards, and this is one of my favorites. It's just a $1 card, but it shows a picture of Crazy Ray Jones, the Cowboys mascot, with the Redskin mascot. I remember out of this rivalry that Crazy Ray would have his fake pistols. He would pull them up and shoot them in the air and have his, uh, have his little uh, pony, his little pogo stick pony, you know, running around on the sidelines, and then the Indian taking a scalp, acting like he was scalping Crazy Ray. Crazy Ray was at the first Cowboy game in their NFL history, Scott, in 1960. The Cowboys lost 35 to 28 in the Cotton Bowl where they played in Dallas. 30,000 fans were there. Crazy Ray kept going to the games and getting the fans involved in the game. Fan participation. Fan participation. He so penance at the game and what his sales pitch was, Scott. You're in sales. You're selling advertising tonight. He said, Free penance, free penance. And when somebody would take one, he said, son, that'll be $1.25 for your tax tonight. So you got to love Crazy Ray. He was, he was, put some, watch some YouTube videos on Crazy Ray Jones and the Dallas Cowboys. In 1974, they adopted him as their official, unofficial mascot. He whistled at the games with a distinct whistle sound. So he was the whistler before the Vandy Whistler was the whistler in baseball. But Crazy Ray Jones, my biggest memory of the Cowboys and Crazy Ray Jones was uh, in this rivalry between the Cowboys and Redskins. We've been talking about concussions all night. Roger Staubach getting knocked out. Dyron Talbert, the defensive tackle for the Redskins, says we're going to knock you out before the game, when the game starts. They knock him out of this game. A rookie by the name of Clint Longley from Abilene Christian University. They called him the Mad Bomber. They called him the Mad Bomber because he was so wild with the football, he hit Tom Landry's tower, watchtower, at one of the practice, and they nicknamed him the, wild, the Mad Bomber. He threw two touchdown passes in the final minutes, the last one to, to Drew Pearson. Dallas beat the Redskins 24-23 on Thanksgiving 74. I watched that game. I remember it, one of my favorite games of all time. Crazy Ray Jones, this is for you and the Cowboys-Redskins rivalries. Go Cowboys. Oh, man, that's priceless. That is priceless. You know, the Redskins were known as the Redskins. In that first game in 1960, what were the Cowboys known as? The Dallas Texans. Yes, they were. 
Good call. Tex Scrams, Dallas Texans. That's going to do it for this week's Gold Ball Sports. Remember, if you would like to advertise on this program, give me a call, 931-247-5566. For Dave Myers and Ken Keller, I'm Scott Shastine. Be good to each other.